Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as a supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O oh Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the Vice President. Honorable Senators, I crave your indulgence to return to this particular item on the order paper at a later stage of the proceedings. Papers. Acting Leader of Government Business. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed in the order paper in the names of the Minister of Finance and the Vice President. The report of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to the progress of the proposals to restructure CLECO, BAT, and CIB for the quarter ended September 30, 2021. The annual audited financial statements of the Power Generation Company of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the year ended December 31, 2010. The 111th report of the Salaries Review Commission of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The 112th report of the Salaries Review Commission of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Reports from committees. Senator Dirup Timal. President, I have the honor to present the following report as listed on the order paper in my name. The second report of the Joint Select Committee on Land and Physical Infrastructure, second session 2021-22, 12th Parliament, on an inquiry into the management of the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission, TNTEC, and related recommendations. Thank you. Senator Hazel Thompson, IE. Mr. Vice President, I have the honor to present the report, the second report of the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs on an inquiry into the status of unproclaimed legislation, part one, the Planning and Facilitation of Development Act 2014 and the Data Protection Act, Chapter 2204, Second Session, 2021-2022, 12th Parliament. Questions, on notice, questions for oral answer. Acting Leader of Government Business. Mr. Vice President, there are three questions on the order, people. The government will be answering all three questions. Senator. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Question number 14 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Public Administration. Mr. Vice President, clause 
Statute 5, Clause 1 of the Royal Charter of the University of the West Indies states that the Vice Chancellor shall be appointed by the Council after consideration of a report from the Joint Committee of the Council and the Senate appointed for the purpose, which shall be an accepted committee to be chaired as the Council shall determine. Accordingly, the Chancellor appointed the requisite Joint Committee of Council and Senate to oversee the process for reviewing the performance of the Vice-Chancellor, consider the reappointment of the Vice-Chancellor and make a report to the Council. At a special meeting of the University Council on January 20th and 21st, 2021, the Joint Committee of Council and Senate presented its findings to the University Council. The Committee did not reach a consensus on the recommendations with respect to the reappointment of the Vice-Chancellor. Government representatives from two contributing countries reserved their position with respect to the reappointment of the Vice-Chancellor. The government considered a number of reports, in particular the 360 assessment of the Vice-Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor self-assessment, the Athene report of 2016, the report from the Chancellor's Commission on Governance, and recommendations of the Joint Committee of Council and Senate. The government noted that the financial position of the university over the years had been reviewed, and while the government was heartened by the university's efforts with respect to its reputation, the deficit position of the university remained a cause of great concern. Based on the information presented in the reports provided to the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and having regard to the need for the role of the Vice Chancellor to have a transformative and new outlook in the approach to the business of education, the government did not support the reappointment of the Vice Chancellor. Mr. Vice President, I wish to clearly state that the government did not delay the renewal of the appointment of the Vice Chancellor. The term of the current Vice Chancellor was due to expire on July 31st, 2021. After significant deliberations at the meeting of the University Council on April 30th, 2021, the Council agreed that the current Vice-Chancellor should be reappointed for a period of six years. Further, Statute 18 of the UE Statutes and Ordinances 2012 provides for the composition of the University Council, which comprises inter alia one member appointed by the government of each of the contributing countries of the University. Hence, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, being a contributing country of UE, would have, appro would have appropriate representation in the University Council as to the governments of all 17 contributing countries and would be part of the approval process for the reappointment of the Vice Chancellor. Mr. Vice President, the government is one member of the University Council, the membership of which exceeds 30 representatives. The decisions made by the Council are accepted and actioned accordingly. Further, the deliberations of the Council are generally confidential in nature and in keeping with good governance and ethical principles, which require the maintenance of confidentiality of boardroom discussions and the fabric of trust and cordiality that should exist among directors and members, the details of such deliberations are not made public. Including closing, Mr. Vice President, the government was not made aware of any breach or established procedures for the renewal of the reappointment of the Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark. Yeah. Um, Mr. Vice President, can the minister indicate what were the reasons? or justification for the government of Trinidad and Tobago not wishing or wanting to support the continuation of Sir Hilary Beckles as Vice Chancellor of the UWI? Can the minister indicate what are the reasons? Minister. Mr. Vice President, as I clearly indicated in my initial response, while the government was encouraged by the positive contribution of the Vice Chancellor and his team to the reputation of the university, we were concerned and remain extremely concerned about the financial affairs. And it is for that reason that we did not support the reappointment of the Vice Chancellor. Thank you. 
can, can the Honorable Minister indicate whether she's aware that the Minister of Education wrote a letter to the Vice Chancellor, to the University Chancellor, I beg your pardon, in January of 2021, advising that Trinidad and Tobago is in favor of searching for a new candidate for the Vice Chancellor of the UWI. Is the minister aware that, that a question. letter was written? I won't allow that question, Senator Mark. Next supplemental. Can I ask the Honorable Minister whether she's aware of the Bermuda Triangle involving the Chancellor, the Prime Minister, and the Principal of the so University? I won't allow that question, Senator Mark. To remove Sir Hillary Beckles. Senator Mark. Senator Mark. Next supplemental. Can the minister indicate, Mr. Vice President, whether she's aware that Chancellor Bermuda is a PNM financier? Sen okay, Senator Mark. Senator Mark. And wishes to fulfill. Senator Mark. So, Senator Mark, that question doesn't arise. So, move on to the next question on the other paper, please. Can I ask? No, I have, I have four questions, sir. I have three. You have three questions. Questions. I am entitled. No, I have four, four supplementals. That was yes, four supplementals. I, You've asked four I have, supplementals. I asked three. You've asked four. Move on to the next question, which is question number fifteen on the order paper, please. All right. Question number fifteen to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, keeping with Statute 10 of the University of the West Indies, Statutes and Ordinances 2012, a campus principal is appointed by the University Council on the recommendation of the Vice Chancellor. The campus principal is also eligible for reappointment for one or more than one such further period. Upon such conditions, it shall from time to time be prescribed by the University Council. Statute 18 of the UE Statutes and Ordinances 2012 provides for the composition of the University Council, which comprises inter alia one member appointed by the government of each of the contributing countries of UE. Hence, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, being a contributing country of UE, would have appropriate representation in the University Council, as do the governments of all 17 contributing countries, and would be part of the approval process for the appointment or renewal of a campus principal. In light of the effects of the global pandemic on the country, a change in the leadership of the campus was not deemed to be in the best interest of the students or staff of the campus or the government of Trinidad and Tobago at this time. The tenure of the current principal was reviewed along with the financial position of the campus and it was found that his stewardship of the campus, the reduction of the budgets of the campus over the last four years, and the demonstrated trust of the campus, thrust of the campus into entrepreneurship and innovation provided evidence to support the continuation of his tenure. Accordingly, Mr. Vice President, the government of Trinidad and Tobago recommended the reappointment of the current campus principal for a period of two years. After significant deliberations at the meeting of the University Council on April 30th, 2021, the council agreed that the current principal of the St. Augustine campus should be offered a one-year contract with the possibility of renewal for a further year. The deliberations of council are generally confidential in nature and in keeping with good governance and ethical principles, the details of such deliberations are not usually made public. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark. Yeah, Mr. Vice President, may I ask the Honourable Minister, whether the extension of this contract for one year deviated or violated sharply from well-established procedures, can the Honourable Minister clarify for this Honourable House? Minister. 
Mr. Vice President, as I indicated, the statutes of UE clearly indicate that a sitting principal can, ter principal's term can be extended for on one or more occasion. So it was not at all in violation. Senator Mark. Can the minister outline briefly what were the achievements of the principal to justify this one-year extension? Minister. Mr. Vice President, again, as I indicated, we examined the performance of the principal over the course of his tenure, and we found that he had developed a good working relationship with the staff of the campus, that he was very active in bringing innovation and development to UE, that he had worked hard to reduce the budgets of the campuses, which was a mandate placed on him by the, by the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and that given the nature of the challenge we had to deal with currently in respect to the pandemic, we thought that it was prudent at this time to reappoint him. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Thank Vice you, President, can the Honorable Minister indicate whether she's aware of any attempt by certain forces led by the Chancellor and including the government, as well as the principal, to privatize the UWI and to make the Chancellor, Executive Chancellor, is the minister aware of So I want to allow that question, moves? Senator Mark, next supplemental. Mr. Vice President, can I ask the Honorable Minister whether she can indicate that this extension of one year was literally as a result of a reward because of what I would like to describe as the Bermuda Triangle? Senator can Mark, I want to allow that question. That next question. Senator basis. Mark. I won't allow that question. Next question on the order paper. Madam, uh, Mr. Vice President, question number 16 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Public Administration. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, I wish to clearly state at the outset that neither the Ministry of Education nor the Minister of Education halted the interviews for the appointment of a new principal of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. In keeping with Statute 10 of the University of the West Indies Statutes and Ordinances 2012, a campus principal is appointed by the University Council on the recommendation of the Vice Chancellor. The campus principal is also eligible for reappointment on one or more than one such further period. Upon such conditions, just shall from time to time be prescribed by the University Council. The University Council may also, as an exception, consider and approve the renewal of a campus principal's contract post-retirement. Additionally, Statute 18 of UE Statutes and Ordinances provides for the composition of the University Council, which comprises inter alia one member appointed by each government by the government of each of the contributing countries of UE. Hence, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, being a contributing country of UE, would have appropriate representation in the University Council, as do the governments of all 17 contributing countries, and would be part of the approval process for the appointment or renewal of a campus principal after the retirement age and any circumstances of exigency. The Ministry of Education had not been advised that the contract of the current St. Augustine campus principal was due to expire at the end of the academic year. On February 22, 2021, the Minister was invited to be part of the interview panel for applicants to the position scheduled for March 4, 2021. In light of the effects of the global pandemic on the country, a change in the leadership of the campus was not deemed to be in the best interest of the students or staff of the campus or the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The tenure of the current principal was reviewed along with the financial position of the campus 
and it was found that his stewardship of the campus, the reduction of the budgets of the campus over the last four years, and the demonstrated thrust of the campus into entrepreneurship and innovation provided evidence to support continuation of his tenure. The government of Trinidad and Tobago therefore advised the university of its recommendation to retain the current principal as the principal of the St. Augustine campus for a further period of two years beyond his scheduled date of retirement of July 2021. The University Council supported the government's recommendation and agreed that the current principal of the St. Augustine campus should be offered a one-year contract with the possibility of renewal for a further year on April 30th, 2021. The meeting noted that precedent had already been set in respect of other campuses as post-retirement contracts were granted by the university in the past. Mr. Vice President, I wish to reiterate that neither the Minister of Education nor the Ministry of Education halted the interviews for the appointment of a new principal of the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, can I? Senator Mark. Can I ask you, Mr. Vice President, to the Honorable Minister, who or which bodies recommended the discontinuation of the interviewing process having been publicly advertised, as you have just claimed, owing to COVID-19 and other factors. Can you advise this honorable Senate? Who were the people behind this decision or which body or unit took that decision to discontinue the interviewing process that will publicly advertise can you clear the air for the Senate? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, again, as I indicated in my initial response, the Ministry of Education was not made aware that the principal was, was approaching retirement and that an interview, proce an interview process had been initiated. When it became aware through the receipt of an invitation to participate in the, on the interview panel, it communicated with the council and indicated its recommendation for the retention of the current principal in his position, and that recommendation was accepted. I cannot say who halted the process of interviews. Senator Ma. In light of what the Honorable Minister said, given the fact that the UWI decided to discontinue this process. Can the minister indicate, Mr. Vice President, that there was a direct interference by the government of Trinidad and Tobago in this well-established process that was properly established and the appropriate personnel applied, can the minister indicate whether there would have been direct interference in this I won't allow that question, Senator Mark. Next supplemental. Mr. Vice President, can the minister indicate whether it is usual for top players to intervene in a process that has been established for the filling of the post of principal of the UWI campus. Is it a normal practice by the bodies or individuals to intervene, Mr. Vice President, to halt and interrupt a process that was agreed upon by the University of the West Indies. Can I ask the Minister to clear? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, again, I will reiterate that neither the Minister nor the Ministry of Education interfered in any process. What I can say is normal, normal practice is that the country 
that houses the particular campus is generally advised of the approaching termination or expiration of the term of a vice principal and given the opportunity to contribute to what the future should hold. That did not happen in this case. We took the opportunity when we were invited to the interview and the council accepted our recommendation. Again, we did not interfere in any process. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Mark. In light of the attempt by these players, what I call the tri Bermuda Triangle, to remove the incumbent vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies, can the minister indicate that the conduct and behavior of the government require a proper investigation so we can get to the bottom of this whole scenario that has embarrassed the University of the West Indies and almost embarrassed the Senator Vice Mark. Chancellor of the University? Do you think, ma Madam, through the President, that there's need for the government to launch an investigation into this matter? I won't allow that question, Senator Mark. That's the end of your supplemental. Introduction of bills. The Sexual Offences Amendment Number 3 Bill 2021 in the name of the Attorney General. Public business, government business, bills, second reader. Honorable scientists, before we get to public business, permit me to revert to item number three on the order paper. Honorable Senators, I have granted leave of absence to Senator the Honorable Clarence Arambarat, who is out of the country. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from Her Excellency the Acting President, Christine Kangalu. The Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, by Her Excellency Christine Kangalu, Acting President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, to Mr. Augustus Thomas. Whereas, Senator the Honorable Clarence Rambarat is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago, now therefore I, Christine Kangalu, acting president as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by section 441A and section 44A of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister do hereby appoint you, Augustus Thomas, to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 7th of December 2021 and continuing during the absence of Senator the Honorable Clarence Rambarat from Trinidad and Tobago, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President St. Anne's this 6th day of December 2021. Honorable Senators, a Senator is required to take the oath. I, Augustus Thomas, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibility to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I'm about to enter.
Honourable Members, the debate on the second reading of the following bill, which was in progress when the Senate adjourned on Tuesday, November the 30th, 2021, will be resumed. A bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Designation, Development, Operation and Management of Special Economic Zones, the Establishment of the Special Economic Zones Authority, the Repeal of the Free Zones Act, Chapter 8107, and the Regulation of Special Economic Zones and Matters Related Thereto. Those who spoke on the previous occasion were Senator the Honorable Paula Gopi Schoon, Minister of Trade and Industry, Mover of the Motion, Senator Jolene John, Senator Diarup Timal, Senator the Honorable Alison West, Minister of Public Administration, Senator Damian Lyder, Senator Hazel Thompson IE, Senator Dr. Mohammed Yunus Ibrahim, and Senator Paul Richards. Senator Dylan Remy. Mr. Vice President, I thank you for allowing me to be able to speak to this bill entitled An Act to Provide for the Designation, Development, Operation, and Management of Special Economic Zones, the Establishment of Special Economic Zones Authority, the Repeal of the Free Zones Act, Chapter 8107, the regulation of special economic zones and matter related thereto. Mr. Vice President, permit me before I start to congratulate the progressive democratic patriots for winning the Tobago House of Assembly election last night with a resounding 15 nil margin. It was not expected necessarily by people, but um, I think the people in Tobago have clearly stated, stated that they desire to manage their affairs in a different manner. Mr. Vice President, President, I think the principles that went into the making of this bill is what Tobagonians have been seeking to change for the past 40 years. Because this bill seeks to legislate that the Tobago House of Assembly applies to a body corporate, the body, the Special Economic Zone Authority, to develop land space in Tobago. When I was preparing last week, I intended to be very short. I will be a little longer today but not very long. And that is because I will just speak to a little more about last evening's elections as it gives me an opportunity to speak on matters pertaining to Tobago as it relates to this bill and internal self-government. Mr. Vice President, I'm pleased that the bill seeks, the bill laid before the Senate today is laid amidst a financially difficult period faced by our country and by extension the world. Undoubtedly, this is a time which requires ingenuity and as such, I commend the initiative that this bill is doing just that. The Special Economic Zones policy document presented by the Ministry of Trade and Industry explains that the bill seeks to 
in clause, no, the policy said, the bill, the bill speaks to modernize Trinidad and Tobago's economic free zones regime, increase the economic and social impact of economic zones in Trinidad and Tobago, enhance the international appeal of Trinidad and Tobago's economic zone regime, and to improve existing and advance new mechanisms and procedures to effectively develop and manage economic zones. Mr. Vice President, I was also pleased to hear Tobago was mentioned in a situation, anal in a, in a, in a situation analysis in which the Honorable Minister of Trade invite, identified light industrial parks as one of the two types of zones. The minister highlighted the Milford Industrial Park, the Sangstels Hill Mall in Tobago, and the Cove Eco Industrial and Business Park managed by the Eco Industrial Development Company of Tobago, EIDCOT Limited, under the purview of the Tobago House of Assembly. Mr. Vice President, I must admit that I'm a bit biased, but I share the boast of Honorable Paula Gopal Schoon made in the newspaper on November 16, 2021, that, and I quote, Tobago, on the other hand, is a prime ecological destination that attracts the savvy tourist and green economy investor. On that note, allow me to share my main concern about this bill, and that is how it has disregarded the functions of the Tobago House of Assembly. Mr. Vice President, clause three of the bill identifies the Tobago House of Assembly as clause three of the bill identifies Tobago House of Assembly and its divisions as a public body. Public body means, I'm reading from the clause three of the bill, and it identifies a public body, means A, a ministry or department, or division of a ministry, B, the Tobago House of Assembly, or a division of the Tobago House of Assembly. And then it goes on to identify other public bodies. So in the bill, the Tobago House of Assembly is identified as a public body. Clause five of the bill outlines the functions of the Special Economic Zones Authority. And some of these include, um, quoting, from the, quoting from the bill, clause five, some of these include B, Clause 5, 1B, regulate and supervise zones. C, advise the minister on matters to support policy formulating, formulation relating to zones. D, recommend to the minister the designation of zones. E, review and assess performance of all zones and report to the minister on the performance of these zones and there were other functions, like formulating guidelines and codes of practice to be observed by the operators, facilitating and enabling environment in areas designated as special economic zones, developing modern infrastructure required to attract foreign direct investment and stimulate domestic investment, promoting economic development in local communities, advancing further diversification of the economy. So those are some of the functions of this, the Special Economic Zones Authority. Mr. Vice President, when I look at the Tobago House of Assembly Act, um, clause 25, three, Section 25.3 of the Act provides, and I quote, where a statutory authority or state enterprise provides services in Tobago, that authority or enterprise shall, 
in exercising its duties in relation to those services act in accordance with the policies or programs of the Assembly and to this end may enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Assembly. And Section 26.2 of the THA Act, and that is Act 40 of 1996, says the government or any authority, statutory authority or state enterprise may, by way of a memorandum of understanding, authorize the Assembly to act as an agent of the government, statutory authority, or state enterprise, as the, cause may, as the case may be, in respect of any of the responsibilities in Tobago. Mr. Vice President, the functions assigned to this body, Special Economic Zones Authority, I think are in direct, um, I would say, conflict with the Tobago House of Assembly's duties as it relates to the Tobago space. Because the fifth schedule of the Tobago Act, for the Tobago House of Assembly Act 40 of 1996, gives Tobago House of Assembly responsibilities for areas including finance, that is to say the collection of revenue and the meeting of expenditure incurred in the carrying out of functions of the Assembly. It's also responsible for state lands, town and country planning, industrial development, among other responsibilities. As I said before, Clause 3 of this bill describes the THA or any of its divisions as a public body. And Clause 34 of the bill says, any of the following may apply for an operator license. A, a public body, B, a private body, or C, a public body and a private body which have entered into a public-private partnership arrangement. It means, therefore, in my understanding of the bill, that uh, um, the Tobago House of Assembly, if it wants to develop an um, economic zone in, the, in Tobago, they will have to put in their application to this authority, the Special Economic Zones Authority, for a license to operate the economic zone in the Tobago space. Mr. Vice President, we are in the year, two, in tw year 2021, and there's a bill in the other place called the Internal Self-Government Bill that seeks to give Tobago the right to make laws to govern the island. We know that the Self-Government Bill is not yet passed. However, why should Tobago, why should there be a bill being presented to the Senate today asking Tobago to apply to a corporate body for permission for a license to develop exclusive economic zone in Tobago. I just don't understand it. Am I to understand that based on the Act 40 of Tobago, of Act 40 of 1996, based on this act, that this bill would have no relevance to Tobago? Mr. Vice President, in the, in the, in, um, when we were debating before, we were asked to su suggest amendments because you wanted the amendments written. I'm just asking the minister, Minister, minister Alwari, the Attorney General, if he would consider an amendment that says this bill does not apply to development of economic spaces in Tobago, and if there is a need for that, it will have to come under the new arrangements with the Internal Self-Government Bill for Tobago. Mr. Vice President, with those few words, I thank you. So, um, Senator Remy, if you want to put that as an amendment, you'll put it in writing, obviously, and circulate it prior to the committee stage, yes? Senator Nakin.
in the name of God, most gracious, the especially merciful. Mr. Vice President, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to comment on this bill entitled the Act to Provide for the Designation, Operation, Management of our Special Economic Zones, Establishment of an SEZ Authority, Repeal of the Free Zones Act, Regulation of SEZs and matters related thereto. I would like, would like also, Mr. Vice President, to comment a bit on a small happening that happened last night that is important to all of us. And I think our esteemed and honorable Prime Minister, after his invitation to the Climate Control Forum, probably got the mandate wrong. It was to have a greener economy, not have a completely green Tobago which is what transpired yesterday, and we'd like to congratulate the PDP on an outstanding showing and victory, which augurs well, not only for Tobago, but for Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, a little house cleaning before I go into the, the clauses of the bill and what I think should be important for an enterprise like this. The Minister of Trade, she mentioned several things, including she talked about the possibility of competition within these SEZs and so. But this bill never really addressed how, with any kind of in-depth analysis, as a matter of fact, when I heard the other speakers and I looked closely at the bill, it was like it's something that could be taken as a legislative framework off of Google. You know, because a bill, although it has to have that legislative framework, it must also be particular to our own circumstances in Trinidad and Tobago that are endemic to us. Because when I looked at the framework, of countries that have these SEZs, like India and so, is almost identically the same, but our circumstances are different to India, Singapore, and all the other countries that we can peruse. Our, for example, just a brief cursory glance at our, our lack of infrastructure, for example, our lack of consultation, all of these things I will touch on in more in-depth analysis. But I, I would think that the Minister of Trade, she would have be a little more, a bit more imagination, imaginative in, in crafting the, you know, or helping craft it or, or presenting the motion because the reality of our situation where we have so many disadvantaged communities, even within places that have a lot of industry. And I take my own example of Chanfleur, for example, where well, that demographic has changed, Mr. Vice President. Carib, or the brewery, Carib and uh, Lever Brothers, for example, Whitco, they were established there and they were placed there since the 40s. Now, if you look at how that demographic was there socially, it was quite different. It was not such a residential area as it is now. So when we have all these emissions from these industries there, I personally looked and have a personal relationship with people who have suffered from the emissions there. I mean, one only needs to look at the back of Carib, where there was a Carib field before that I played on for years, which was part of the CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility of Carib Breweries, and which they, they, they fulfilled to an extent before they changed hands. And when you look at the sludge that com comes out into that river behind Carib, you have to ask yourself, is that good for the, the residents that live in Mont Lambert, Chanfleur, Second Chanfleur, St. Joseph? You understand what I mean, Mr. Vice President? So it's important for us 
to be a bit more imaginative when we, we create such a legislation and such an, an attempt to have something which, by all accounts, and everyone will admit it, will be something good for the country if you can establish these zones. But we can't forget our existing condition and infrastructure. And I repeat again, is it any more worthwhile, maybe in these SEZs, to have some kind of relocation of existing industry, although it will be hard, but is one life worth the profit, or perhaps the minister would say, well, they bring employment to that area. But is it one life? How much is it worth? Is it one life, two lives, three lives, dead by, by emissions, by pollution, by cancer? Just something to think about. So we saw, obviously, the, the many advantages to such a, to such a bill a creation of SEZs and their maintenance, implementation, and, and all of that. You know, we have an increase in exports, increase in possible investment, employment, develop, development of infrastructure facilities. We hope it will foster economic development, industrial development. But, and this is the problem that I have, not only with this bill, but with this government. With such a creation of such zones, Mr. Vice President, further esconds the already capitalized class. I, I haven't seen anything in this bill that can point to perhaps an attempt to have a new class of entrepreneurs emerge. Is there any initiatives that could be put in place that we can have people, for example, who normally would not have access to capital, perhaps have that access by this bill that they could enter into perhaps a bilateral relationship with a foreign company. So instead of the same old, same old companies that we all know about, benefiting from such a bill, let's have some of that disadvantage, what we like to say, unemployed, underemployed, people struggling along the East West Corridor and, and in rural communities, let's have something in the bill that makes it mandatory for them to be part of where we want to go. And that's, that's my major problem with this bill. There's no overall vision. And it, it, that brought me to, to Senator Ibrahim, who didn't understand what Senator John was saying, you know, because it doesn't become a free zone. It doesn't move from being a free zone to a special economic zone just by a name change. And he missed that point that Senator Julian John was making. It's not even about the policy formulation. Because poly po policy can be formed, formulated, can be drafted. We know that. All ones discarded. It's about the deliverables. And that's what's not present in this bill. And, I, I don't, that's, and that's the point that Julian John was making. Where are the deliverables? It doesn't point to that. So it's nice, all well and good to have the policy formulation and all of that. And it's important. But there should be a little more meat on that bone if we want to use these SECs to take our subclass of workers, workers that are not involved in capital formulation and, and moving ahead and getting into that class of an entrepreneurs, to bring them out of that darkness into the light. That should be of the vision of proper policy, in my humble opinion. So, I will not go in detail about we saw what is what is what are the advantages. So I will talk about a little bit about what I think could be done. So we have perhaps even with increasing economic activity, 
because of all the tax concessions that these industries would have, we would have a, most likely an increase in fiscal deficit. We know this government already has a problem with tax collection. And a poor, very poorly drafted tax revenue authority bill was brought, which I criticize personally because of the power that it gave to, to who runs it, the Minister of Finance. So we have to be careful in balancing all these tax concessions that there is not an increase in the fiscal deficit that has happened in several countries. Then you can look at a concentration in these, because of these SCZs, if you're going to have a loss of business units, a loss to business units, in non-SEC areas. And that's, that goes back against to the capital formulation idea, Minister of Trade. Well, through you, Mr. Vice President. And this is of serious concern, why? And, I, and that, that points to the endemic circumstances of our country. We know, it doesn't matter the government, I don't want this to be any political partisan Submission here. We know that financiers, business, business people are, have close ties to government. Would these SCCs contribute to a loss to small and medium enterprises that are not part of that area? We have to be careful of that. We do not want to have a situation where mon monopolies are created at the expense of the small man, the poor and working class people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I didn't see anything in the bill to address that. The loss to the business units that would be created out of the non-SCZ areas. And let's be clear, when I talk about circumstances endemic, we have seen the decimation of the SMEs under this government over the last two years, especially in this COVID period. We have seen Absolutely no help given to them, complaints about no grants, no relief grants, not even the attempt to approach the central bank to have some relief for this, these, these, these small and medium enterprises. I mean, how are we going to come now with a bill totally neglecting those circumstances that have that has taken place? And that, that, and that again, this place to me, this government's disconnect with the ground, disconnect with their own people. They cannot seem to understand that this bill is going to be interpreted, seen as just another way to make things easier for the existing business class. I mean the upper business class, I'm not, and, and, and that is not my concern, and that is never the concern, that's not the concern of the opposition. Our concern is how can we, with this bill, bring more people into the system of business, to be entrepreneurs, to create their own wealth. So we could cut 200 avocado, green outside, yellow inside, talk about bananas, and, but we have to be careful we don't have a Pomerac situation, so that when you open the red, we're not only seeing a certain color inside. We have to be careful with that. Our major stakeholders in this country must not be major stakeholders in name. Our major stakeholders must have a major stake in this country. And that message was sent very clearly last night. Then we can have an ignorance of, our, of a balanced regional development. For example, if obviously the fence, lines, the fence line communities around these SCZs, Mr. Vice President, they will benefit. 
they will benefit from the infrastructure that will have to be set up to accommodate perhaps some foreign direct investment, foreign companies. But even in Trinidad and Tobago, that conventional wisdom that normally applies is turned upside down. Because one would think, looking at some of the industrial areas that, we, that exist, that we call free zones and so, you would say those fence-line communities would have been well-developed and so, but they are not. And the question is why? Shafler, Mongdo, Pitibu, problems for water, electricity, flooding. Why only in this country, under this government, things seem to be so upside down and can't seem to be on course in order to bring everybody into the, into the, into the society to have a fair chance, to have some, some sense of equity. I don't understand. I don't want to believe it's, an, it's intentional. There must be good people on that side. There must be. Nothing was mentioned in the bill about what could be possibly be or would have to be a mandated corporate social responsibility for some of the com companies that will come in, whether they be foreign or local. We see our sporting facilities in a mess. Our sport, national sporting teams are a mess. Why couldn't that policy be one along the Belgian line where it's more holistic, where these companies coming in have to give something to sporting associations and the NSOs? Something like that would be a bit creative, imaginative, so we, we don't have to rely on, on hopscotch players to direct our policy. Sport is important to disadvantaged communities. Sport is integral to the ambition of hopes and hopes of people coming from these community, communities. I could count offhand 50 players who came from these disadvantaged communities who have become national sporting heroes. Why not use these SEZs to have some kind of derivative fund out of it for the sports? Just an example I'm giving here. Because the money allotted to allocate it for sports can do nothing. You send our athletes, our, our warriors, you send them out to be killed, slaughtered. 15 nil. 15 nil. Then we can have, Mr. Vice President, I want to know, were there any consultations conducted with labor and trade unions about these possibilities? When he, uh, and that's a direct question to you, Mr. Vice President, for the Minister of Trade. Were any consultants, consultations done at all with these labor and trade unions? I'll tell you why. A lot of foreign companies who come in, they, they, some normally ignorant of labor laws. We have examples given where workers who are brought into these SCZs are very badly treated. They work longer hours than normal, as mandated by the country. So were, were there any consultations? And I didn't see anything in the bill addressing that. Another Achilles heel of this government, the lack of consultation they do. And I, don't, I, ask, I ask again, is that intentional? I don't, I don't believe it. It is. But if it's an oversight, it's a serious oversight. Even... Were there any consultations with business communities, with the business, cham with the business chambers? Because right now, these business chambers seem to be parroting everything under the sun, mounted by this government. So at least there should have been some kind of consultation with them. I didn't see anything about it. So the question is, was Ansel Roger sold another pipe dream that put 10,000 workers out of a job? I hope not. Consultation, Minister of Trade, consultation. That is crucial 
to business or emerging business and a democracy. And then we come without proper procurement legislation. So what could result in undue haste in approving SEC proposals? You know, we have to be wary of cutting corners. You know, there's a possibility, no aspersions being made here, but there's a possibility, and it's documented, corruption could be engendered, facilitated, so we have to be careful about how we go about sanctioning these things or approving these, these businesses that we want to come in. And it comes back again. I said, why not look at a model in the Middle East? And I, I looked at Qatar, Dubai. At one time, at one time, even in, in Lebanon, where any business coming in, foreign business, or even local established businesses, that there must be legislation where they have to partner bilaterally, multilaterally, they have to partner with local, small local companies. They must, it has to be, it's mandated there should be a certain amount of workers trained, put into programs. All of these things can happen with a little more imagination rather than just the writing and formulation of policy. And the question is, why wouldn't there be, if you want to take the country forward, along what is, which is what is ideally and in principle something that could benefit the country. Again, the question must be asked, why by its omission, the invisibility of anything to uplift the communities that need something like this? Complete omission. And then the question will be asked, then for who is this, who has the existing capital to enter these SECs? And the answer will be clear. The answer will be clear. And we have to guard against this, Mr. Vice President, that this does not become just another chance for that existing business class that seems so close well, closer than this should be, to a government that doesn't seem to represent the people on the ground. Were there any consultations with the MEA when it comes to what could possibly be, possibly be the laws of agricultural land to establish these SECs? We've seen, we've seen instances before in Trinidad, and that's why I keep taking it back to our circumstances, endemic to us. We've seen instances where fertile agricultural land was taken away for housing projects. I only have to point to the nurseries, St. Augustine nurseries, where right now there's a housing project being put where there are wells, water wells on that land and there's a housing project being carried on. Some people say, for voter pardon, I wouldn't say that. I'm asking the question, Mr. Vice President. Why on arable land, fertile land, establish to bolster, foster, nurture the agriculture industry, which, as we know, has been lacking Nothing innovative has, has been done. Senator, you have five more minutes. Already? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice. Why? Who on earth, what government in their right mind would think now to come and take away that agriculture land where plants are grafted and so to avoid 
falling to disease and all of that that we have locally. Who would come and think now to put housing there? If you could do that, then you want to come and pass a bill and let us feel, believe that you're doing something to help the people with this. So, Mr. Vice President, my time literally flew. My problem with this government, and I make no bones about it, is that there seems never seems to be anything that is in the interest of the poor and working class men and women of this country. And what a, and what a pity, and what a pity. We are placed now in a very precarious time. I think this government got the message loud and clear last night that the old diatribes and dialogue of bullying and race will not count with the people of this country anymore. So let's use this bill, of course with amendments, to perhaps cater for the poor and working class man, the disadvantaged communities along the east-west corridor, the rural areas of Trinidad and Tobago. And let's not play politics with this bill for the benefit of friends and financiers. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Minister in the Office of the Attorney General. Mr. Vice President, I thank you most sincerely for the opportunity to contribute uh, to this debate. You know, for the benefit of the listening and viewing public, what is amazing to me, and I'm sure all of my colleagues in the Senate who would have done their homework in preparation of this bill, um, what is amazing to me is that in 2012, Mr. Vice President, there was a World Bank report entitled The Promotion and Service of Foreign Investment in Trinidad and Tobago. It was also called a Way Forward Volume 1 Executive Survey. And in that particular report, um, the World Bank made recommendations to the then government, which is the UNC government, um, of the inefficiency policy framework that existed in Trinidad and Tobago. They identified a weak legal and regulatory framework system. That report identified poor reporting by existing zones. It reported and identified a need for new policy to modernize the development of SEZs in Trinidad. All of this form part of a report that was presented to the United National Congress when they were in government in 2012. Now, I can understand 2010, you're now relishing and enjoying coming into power. 2011, I believe, uh, so, so nothing happened, of course, relative to that report. The report was not in existence. 2011, there were some amendments made to the Anti-Terrorism Act, Chapter 1207. But, Mr. Vice President, 2012, based on the recommendations of that report, nothing was done. 2013, based on that recommendation, nothing was done. 2014, they, they were still in power. Nothing based on that recommendation were done. I could, and I could continue until their power came to an end. So it is absolutely amazing to me when members of the opposition come here and most respect, they, they, they present, uh, you know, they speak as a champion for the grassroots and a champion for those persons on the ground. But yet history dictates that when they had an opportunity to serve those who were really on the ground, what did they do? Absolutely nothing. And I want the people of Trinidad and Tobago to be minded of this. Now, Mr. Vice President, uh, you know the Honorable Senator Naked, he asked the question about consultation. I heard consultation about 20 times in his presentation. Where was the consultation? Well, I will say to Trinidad and Tobago, and I have to congratulate the Minister of Trade and Industry as I begin my presentation in this debate, because consultation, I will, I will tell this Honorable Senate, and I will tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago where consultation went. In 2017, it began. 
It began under this Minister of Trade and Industry. It began with what? The Organization for Economic Co Cooperation and the Development of OC OECDs. Right? OECDs, sorry. That was consultation to make sure that this, this bill that we presented today was compliant with that framework. We had to also, consultation took place because we had to ensure that it was consistent with base erosion, profit share, and inclusive framework. Consultation took place there. Consultation took place because we had to ensure that this policy, this bill that appears before us, was consistent with the European Union Code of Conduct Group. Consultation took place there. Consist we had to also ensure that this bill that appears before us was consistent with the revised Treaty of Chagramas, in particular Article 239. So consultation took place there. So respectfully to the Honorable Senator, consultation, consultation, this is consultation. Trinidad and Tobago, I want to say to you, this government we recognize is not a parlor we run in. And because it's not a parlor we run in, we understand that it takes time to try to get things right. And as a consequence, from 2017, the minister with her technocrats, together with the Attorney General, Minister of Finance, Prime Minister have been working assiduously to ensure that the bill that appears in this carnation, in the incarnation that appears before this Honorable Senate, can stand the test to scrutiny. So, Mr. Vice President, I hope respectfully I would have answered the concerns of the Honorable Senator, Mr. Naked, who was very much concerned about consultation as it took place in the creation of this bill. Now, the crux of my presentation, if, I, if time permit me, Mr. Vice President, I may want to look at the role of inspectors um, as it exists in the bill that appears before us. And again, if time permits me, permits, I would want to also focus on some of the offenses um, that are created under this bill. But before I do that, respectfully, there are certain um, points that has been placed on the record, questions that were asked by honorable colleagues in the Senate. And I'm sure the Minister of Trade and industry in her winding up. She will deal with the majority of it. I know the Attorney General will join in in this debate and he too would add his expertise. But there are certain points um, that, uh, you know, at least uh, I believe that I'm best, I I'm positioned to be able to make a contribution. And those are the points made by other senators. Now, I would firstly like to respond to certain questions, a few questions that was asked by the Honorable Senator, um, Ms. Jolene John. Um, I must say for the record, Mr. Vice President, at least at the time that I have been in this Senate, I've always enjoyed Ms. John's uh, um, presentation, particularly because she does not relegate to gutter politics. And it's usually a contribution that uh, has some kind of substance, some kind of intellectual substance. Um, so I have to, I have to identify that. But the learned senator um, asked the question whether in summer weather, in some of these compliance, what are the advantages and how is this impacting negatively or positively on Trinidad and Tobago? And I would rather I would rather focus on the positive implications. And, and that was in dealing with the topic of blacklisting of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, of course, the honorable senator asked that question. Now, Mr. Vice President, um, you know, and especially for the benefit, and I'm sure this is not something new to the Honorable Senator because clearly she is, you know, very versed in this area. Um, compliance, Mr. Vice President, it creates an avenue for integration in the country's financial system, um, especially in the global financial system as AML preventative measures, as we know such as customer due diligence, identification of beneficial ownership of financial assets, and suspicious transaction reporting, we know can definitely impede um, tax fraud and, of course, tax evasion. So um, if we are to ask what are some of the advantages of being compliant, there we have it. Also to the Honorable Senator, um, looking at its impact on Trinidad and Tobago and the advantages of being compliant, we also have um, the protection of the integrity and stability, Mr. Vice President, of the international financial system, and the SECs would then benefit as their aim of attracting new and foreign business and business of a different caliber, Mr. Vice President, will be done. 
You know, I also want to add for the record, according to the national SEZ policy, improving worldwide compliance with AML and CFT standards benefits the entire international financial architecture, uh, as which we know is very important to Trinidad and Tobago, having had setbacks um, in financial trade relationships arising out of said blacklisting. Um, finally, to the Honorable Senator, strong AML, CFT controls increase public confidence in financial institutions and national systems and of course they promote the integration of markets and investment through cross-border financial um, and direct of course foreign investment so um, this was just in response uh, to the honorable senator question as it relates to how will we benefit um, by ensuring certain compliances within the regime or within the structure of this bill now, the Honorable Senator also asked a question. How are we attracting direct foreign investment while we are there to all of these measures. And to be quite honest, this was one of my concerns as well when I had a look at the bill because, you know, some you want to make ensure that, uh, you know, you crack down on money laundering. You want to make sure that you crack down on all of these white color crime as it exists in the zone. But at the same time, you want to make the climate attractive for investors. You know, sometimes you go to apply for something and when you look at the form alone, and this is for the benefit of normal, uh, for the pe persons on the ground, you 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 look at this form alone and the form turn you off and you decide now nah, I'm not even bothering to apply for this grant so I, I understand where the senator is coming from because really and truly it was a concern of mine especially for those smaller um, businesses who may want to operate in his own but uh, unfortunately, as a responsible government, it is a balancing act that we have, um, we, we, we have to focus on. So while we introduce uh, stringent measures in order to monitor and manage um, any white color crime that may be in existence in the particular zones, uh, in the zone, what we also have to do, um, what we have also done in the, in, by, by virtue of this bill and the policy that this bill was predicated upon is also introduce a lot of incentives with the hope that the incentives will far outweigh um, the task uh, of persons understanding that they're being monitored and, and, and all of that. Some of the incentives, uh, um, now the types of, and levels of incentives were, are magnanimous in accordance to this. In, if we look at the bill, uh, we have time periods in which these incentives are offered, which we also hope are, is attractive. The nature of incentives, if you look at the bill, there are financial and non-financial incentives offered. We also have locational specificity um, of these zones. So we are, we are hoping that uh, this would have created the balance, um, the balance uh, which is much needed um, in uh, managing the zones, uh, um, ensuring that we, we clamp down on any existence um, of white color crime or, or any sort of uh, you know criminal activity within the zones, but at the same time, incentivizing it so people can still be at attracted. Now, the Honorable Senator also asked a question and as it relates to the topic of gross negligence. She was focusing on Clause 19 of the bill. And the question was, now who, Mr. Vice President, decides on um, whether something is uh, gross ne grossly negligent, right? Now, to answer the Honorable Senator, I want to take the Honorable Senator to Clause 15 2 B, F, and G of the bill, which says, the board may, by instrument in writing, remove the chief executive officer from this, from his office, and, and that those clauses go on to speak to the board having the responsibility, um, of course, to discipline. Um, uh, a chief ex, uh, the, the, the CEO of a company uh, of the authority. Now, looking at 15.2, Mr. Vice President of the bill, um, this determines. Uh, Basic, we, we can see is really the board of directors, as I indicated before, determines uh, whether we have uh, wh whether an act by the CEO would be deemed as gross negligent. And uh, also to, to answer the honorable senator's question, um, there's reason why, Mr. Vice President, we have not been too prescriptive in this provision. And the reason for that is because certainly we do not want to run the risk uh, 
um, of infringing on the separation of powers. That is the role of the judiciary along with the role of the legislature. So what you would also find, if I may also respectfully take the senator in answering that question, we can also turn to other pieces of law because the existence of this bill does not, uh, um, does not uh, eradicate the existence of other existing trite law in Trinidad. So for example, if we look at section 30B of the Companies Act, uh, um, we know not to conf um, conflate the CEO and the chairman as they are treated as two separate entities. Also, if we look at Division 4 of the Companies Act, Mr. Vice President, this spells out offenses and penalties, um, specifically section uh, uh, 523, I believe, uh, which empowers the court to grant relief in certain cases, such as negligence and a breach of duty. Therefore, Mr. Vice President, um, what to, to answer the Honorable Senator, we also have the court can make the ultimate determination on whether an act committed by a CEO or an employee amounts to gross negligence. So there was no need for us to be prescriptive in this bill when there are other trite pieces of law in which a CEO, any gross negligence that occurs within the authority can be dealt with. Now, even if we look at the Industrial Relations Act, um, if, if the, the allegations that are made or the case that appears can fall within the parameters of what relief the Industrial Relations Act provides. That is also another piece of legislation that can work in tandem with the bill that appears before us to deal with issues of gross negligence. Um, so I, I had some more comments I wanted to offer, but uh, I know for the interest of time, I would have to move on. Um, if I may now respectfully turn to Senator Lider, um, there was certain, you know, the, 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 sen the Honorable Senator, Mr. Vice President, in his contribution, he made the point the government's track record does not instill confidence in the ability to deliver on aims and objectives of this proposed bill. Senator Lider commented specifically that Clause 5.1 gives the indication that the government failure Yes. Um, of this government's failure, where he made a reference to the words, uh, the bill developed modern infrastructure required to attract foreign direct investment and stimulate dom domestic um, investment. Now, Mr. Vice President, in order to determine, firstly, whether this government instills confidence in the ability to deliver aims and objectives of the SEZ, we must look at the present law, which currently is in operation. So when Senator Leider makes reference to a clause that has not yet been cemented into law as a result of it yet not going through the parliamentary process of a vote um, with someone who I would expect who has been sitting in parliament for the past year on the opposite end should have an understanding. Um, in this regard, I recommend that the senator revisit the basic principles, Mr. Vice President, uh, um, of parliamentary procedure because certainly he's in no position uh, to speak about our failure and the failure of this bill, it, it having not been operationalized. Um, to date and still presently on the floor of, of this Honorable Senate. Now, Mr. Vice President, um, if I may also um, add um, uh, or contribute to another point made by the Honorable Senator, um, he made reference to Schedule 4, which contained the criteria, one of which is that the number of full-time qualified employees physically present for large enterprises to be at least 50. The Honorable Senator also proposed an amendment that the language does not require 50-plus staff to be physically in the zone, but rather staff to be actively located in the zone, whether remotely or in the zone. Respectfully, I submit to this Honorable Senate uh, the rationale for providing this criteria is because it is commonplace, Mr. Vice President, with international report, which international reports substantiate that operators can set up shell companies, shell companies which do not fit the ordinary brick and mortar description of a business. Um, as we all know, these shell companies uh, uh, can present itself in various form, and uh, they can be used, as we also know, for tax evasion, corruption, money laundering, to name a few. Um, I may also respectfully re um, submit to the Honorable Senator that in 2018, in a report entitled um, An Overview of Shell Companies in the European Union, this provided an explanation, Mr. Vice President, to what is called special purpose entities. Um, this type, uh, this is a third type of shell company, as we all know, which are entities with no or few employees. 
or no physical presence in a host economy and whose assets and liabilities only represent investments. So to the Honorable Senator, this is why within the bill we have prescribed the restriction on the number of employees required because we are ensuring that we are also consistent and we, we are not oblivious to the fact that Shell Company is, uh, um, is a reality in Trinidad and Tobago and it is one of the battles that as a government uh, um, who's aimed in fighting white color crime that we would have to tackle. Um, if I may also respectfully take the Honorable Senator to Section 5, uh, 35.2 sorry, of the Kenya Special Economic Zone Act, which was one of the comparators that we relied upon in the drafting of this particular bill. Um, it also has a similar provision. Um, so we are not deviating, in other words, to the Honorable Senator from the norm. Rather, we or, or rather, we are not legislating by mere, uh, merely the toss of a coin. We have, relied, we have done our homework and we are relying upon international comparators in the establishment of this particular zone. Um, as I, well, there are other things I wish I could have had the opportunity to respond, but again, for the interest. Mr. Vice President, can you tell me how much time again I have? And at 11.43. About 10 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. So, um, I, so quickly, if I move on, um, you know, to the Honorable Senator, Mr. Timal, um, I recall the question was asked, uh, how would legal action and measures of enforcement be dealt with against an unincorporated entity? Um, you know, Clause 6, the authority says that the authority shall have the following powers to take enforcement measures in the event of uh, any non-compliance uh, or a breach of this act or terms and conditions of a license. Now, Mr. Vice President, by definition, an unincorporated entity is one who does not have, as we all know, a separate legal entity from its members. Therefore, while the entity, respectfully to the Honorable Senator, um, while, therefore, while the entity cannot sue or be sued, the owners and operators can be sued. And if for the record, I may respectfully take this Honorable Senate to the case of London Association of Protection of Trade versus Greenland Limited. Um, it's a court of appeal case. Uh, that would have actually identified, um, and it's one of the locus classicus, on how you treat at least litigation-wise uh, with unincorporated companies. So, I mean, there were other things I wish I could have offered an explanation for, but I'm sure my colleagues would have, but I hope that, uh, you know, add some clarity um, to the Honorable Senator. Now, Senator Paul Richards made some um, pertinent contributions, um, which I would like to respectfully offer an explanation for. Um, Senator um, Paul Richards focused on the lack of regulatory and monitoring frameworks. So, for example, he made many of these economic zones become a dumping ground for contrabands and fake products, illegal transshipment of contrabands and goods, services, a lack of transparency and accountability mechanisms. And this, I believe, is a very pertinent concern, right? Because uh, you don't want, uh, you know, things running afoul within the zones. But if I may respectfully um, take the Honorable Senator to Section 45 of the Customs Act 7801, um, this contains, of course, a comprehensive list of items that are prevented from being imported. Um, Clause 65 one in the bill that appears before us, Mr. Vice President, um, it states that subject to the provisions of this act, the Customs Act and the Excise General Provisions Act shall apply in the zone to the extent required for the controller of customs and excise to carry out his obligations. Um, close procedure and practice, and this is um, 652D of this bill says, efficient procedures and practices to be applied for goods imported from customs territory to a zone and exported from a zone in a customs territory. So I hope uh, that, uh, I hope this uh, um, answers uh, uh, the Honorable Senator's uh, um, concern, right? Um, the Honorable Senator, Mr. Vice President, also made the point uh, um, of the migrant uh, workers. And that is a very critical point because the Honorable Senator said, we also need to be very mindful um, and careful about ensuring that labor practices in these free zones are in line with our labor laws in Trinidad and Tobago and in relation to migrant workers. Now, um, I had the benefit of sitting alongside um, the Attorney General recently um, in the United Nations periodic review. And certainly the issues of migrant 
immigrants even came up, and I know that at the Troika recommendations, uh, the Attorney General did note um, some of the recommendations uh, that were presented to us. But, Mr. Vice President, if I may respectfully, on the, on the issue of migrant workers, if I may respectfully take uh, um, this Senate to the International Labour Organization, the ILO Standards, um, that governs this area, um, as well as the government. I want to I, I want to put on a record remains cognizant of the need to offer protection to the vulnerable and working class population. Now, the International um, Labour Organization, Mr. Vice President, uh, the functions of the ILO include the development and promotions of standards for national legislation to promote and improve working conditions, standard of living conditions, and a whole host of other things, which of course, because of time, I cannot get into. But but we are hoping that, again, um, with the interoperability of laws uh, that would exist, um, this zone certainly does not exist in a silo, and uh, other existing laws um, would, of course, be able to operate. So as it relates to the migrant, I could respectfully take the Honorable Senator um, to that particular, um, that international labor organization. Um, the ILO. So that, uh, I mean, of course, in the interest of time, there's so much more I wish I could have contributed, but I can't. Um, at least, to add a little more, I, uh, well, my contribution as I started off by saying um, I would have also wanted to focus on the role of inspectors and uh, if, I don't know if time would permit, offenses that are created. Now, why I'm focusing on inspectors, Mr. Vice President, to do so, I have to respectfully uh, delve into clause 67 and 70. But prior to doing that, I would have to look at, I want to respectfully look at clause 53.5 of this bill. Now, 53.5, um, um, uh, and I'm sure my colleagues, we all have the bill before us, so I wouldn't read it verbal. I wouldn't read it from the bill. Um, what this does, Mr. Vice President, is that, uh, in essence, what it's saying is that the licensee is giving consent um, up front to the inspector to carry out his duties to ensure there is compliance with the SEC bill. Uh, the powers of the inspectors are restricted to that set out uh, um, as we go further down in the bill in clause 70. Now, this is a license, so it is... It is simply, Mr. Vice President, based on the law of contract as well. Um, and what it does, Mr. Vice President, is that it creates a relationship in Minister, law. Minister, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. It creates a relationship in law between the licensee and the licensor um, in the granting of the requisite license. Now, why I believe this was important to, to focus on the, 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 the framework that we've created um, in Chapter 9 of this bill, the inspectors, is because of the rules of the inspectors, right? Um, they are really the ones who would be ensuring compliance um, with all of the provisions uh, that exist within the bill. And therefore, their role and function is critical uh, to the smooth operation and the success um, of these zones and persons more so being compliant. Um, the roles of the inspectors, just to name a few, Mr. Vice President, um, it is stated in clause 66.1, um, to, they, they are able to conduct inspections. The inspect two inspectors will embody a high level of competence as prescribed in the legislation. Um, they will be trained and they will have the requisite qualification established by the authority, and that is in clause 66.2. Now, how is enforcement uh, done, Mr. Vice President? Um, the government, of course, we understand that we must continue to protect the Section 4 constitutional rights of citizens and uh, therefore as responsible legislators, we understood in the creation of this regime, we had to focus on what was the legitimate aim of the creation of these inspectors. And I can justify respectfully to this honorable Senate the justification in the creation of um, in in the creation of these inspectors uh, um, to, to to you know dismiss any doubt that any persons may have on the issue of constitutionality and the rules and functions of these uh, um, these inspectors. Uh, I may, for the record, some of the legitimate aim in creation of this regime, Mr. Vice President, was for ensuring that Trinidad and Tobago is consistent with the requirements as currently set out, um, as I would have stated in the OECD, the BEPS, the EU, and uh, and other pieces of um, existing treaties or, or legislation that exist. Another legitimate aim was to enhance the attractiveness of business climate in Trinidad and Tobago, while also, of course, protecting the domestic revenue base uh, to a great, to the greatest extent of, as possible, and 
another legitimate aim in the creation of this inspector regime. Um, one which I may respectfully submit is to regulate supervised SEZs to increase the economic and social impact of economic zones um, in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so, Mr. Vice President, um, I can, you know, certainly say that we have uh, ensured that we have crossed our T's, we have dot our I's, we've ensured that this bill has not, even with the creation of inspectors, um, inspectors who can then be accompanied by police officers um, with or without a warrant. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are certain, those that might be certain points the Attorney General may probably develop. Um, I am, it is fair to say that, we, as I said, we have crossed our T's, we have dot our I's, and we have not tripped over any constitutional rights um, of our citizens of Trinidad and Tobago uh, in the creation of these inspectors. Um, now, there are several offenses, Mr. Vice President, created throughout the length and breadth of this bill. Clause 73, for example, creates uh, a clause which I call the false information um, uh, the false information offense. We have a breach of confidence, 74-1, which I call the confidentiality clause. We have 75-1, which creates another offense, holding oneself out to be a licensee. We have other offenses that are created. And then, of course, we have the whole um, administrative fines, which are dealt within clause 76. Now, what, uh, wh why I'm mentioning, uh, um, as I close, uh, as I conclude my contribution, um, these offenses is because, again, this is yet another attempt by this government to continue our fight against uh, white color crime. We're not oblivious as to what can transpire in the zone. And hence, uh, uh, my colleagues, all of us who have the benefit of looking at the bill, we can revert to these clauses, which creates uh, uh, these offenses, uh, and of course, there are fines and penalties that are attached that the bill goes on to speak about. Uh, so, Mr. Vice President, in my con in conclusion, I want to congratulate again the Minister of Trade and Industry um, for doing the work that was necessary in order to create this bill uh, that be that appears before you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, with the intention of only serving all manner of people, Mr. Vice President, without fair or favor. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Senator Dion Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the opportunity to contribute to, the, to this debate today on an act to provide for the designation, development, operation, and management of special economic zones, the establishment of the Special Economic Zone Authority, the repeal of the Free Zones Act, the regulation of the special economic zones and matters related thereto. Now, Mr. Mr. Vice President, much has already been said uh, during the first day and so far on the second day of this debate. And I would therefore try to avoid repeating what was already said. I interestingly have a very much different perspective on this bill before us today. So my contribution would focus on commenting on the general policy in the sense of asking the question, uh, special, uh, is establishing a special economic zone necessary right now? I look at the role of the operator. I ask questions with respect to the procurement and why procurement Procuring of licenses is not being considered in the bill. And I look, I also want to look at the way in which this bill is aligned to the national development strategy of Trinidad and Tobago. Should time permit, I would take some time to look at the functions of the authority in terms of both the composition and coordination factors that is embedded in the bill. Now, I, I would say up front that I do have some amendments that I hope can improve the bill, and I would provide those in writing before committee stage starts. So, as I said, I would like to comment on the whole feasibility of this special economic zone policy in the context of fulfilling the objectives of expanding our revenue base, diversifying exports, increasing private sector participation, integrating special economic zones into the whole national development objectives of Trinidad and Tobago. 
So special economic zones around the world have a mixed record of success, with some countries being quite successful, such as China, Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, even Jamaica within the region, and others still struggling after decades of establishing and operating special economic zones. These countries um, tend to concentrate in the area in, in sub-Saharan Africa and India, to name a few. Now, while I understand the deficiencies of the Trinidad and Tobago Free Zones Act, and um, Senator Saram Singh Suklal did point to that World Bank report, which I did have the opportunity to look at as well, um, and this bill certainly attempts to resolve some of the institutional regulatory legal issues which were identified in, in that report. But however, there are still underlying structural issues when it comes to creating an environment to attract new dynamic investments. And I'm not too sure if the solution is the establishment of special economic zones. So, the special economic zone regime may not be necessary for the purpose of addressing the binding constraints to economic development in Trinidad and Tobago. These binding constraints, we are all familiar with them. It continues to plague Trinidad and Tobago. It continues to plague trade facilitation in Trinidad and Tobago. And it includes low investment, low economic returns, low human capital, you skills mismatches, poor infrastructure, high cost of finance, trade logistics. I could name a whole lot more, Mr. Vice President. In my view, if the constraints can be addressed through countrywide country reforms, then the special, special economic zones may not necessarily be, be relevant at this point in time. When there is still room to address the country's economic development challenges through the reforms needed to promote competitiveness, and here I, 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 I know that there's a Trade Facilitation Act. I actually expected to see the Trade Facilitation Act present itself before this, this piece of legislation. And in such instances, the this SEZ model becomes a, what to call it, a second best solution in addressing these binding constraints of growth and economic development in the country. Because what SECs tend to do is introduce an element of inequality in the sense that SECs gives preference to specific sets of firms based on predefined criteria, fiscal incentives, and in some instances, non-fiscal incentives. So have we, I, I, I asked the question, Mr. Vice President, have we exhausted other reform measures needed to create a competitive business environment conducive to trade facilitation in Trinidad and Tobago? Or are we going to be working on them simultaneously? How would it work out if that is the case? Because the last that I checked, there are still so many other structural problems that needs to be addressed when we speak about trade facilitation and investment and diversification. Why introduce this regime now when we have plenty work to do when it comes to creating an environment where SEZs can prosper? You see, Mr. Vice President, adopting a SEZ is a very expensive undertaking. And no, I'm not going to go into the whole debt scenario. Um, it is a very expensive undertaking, and it involves very careful and skilled planning, design, and management. It's something that you really shouldn't be taking lightly. When SECs are being championed, it should be being introduced in a country. It really should be something that the whole country is on board with. It's something that should be championed by the highest office in the level of government. In so many countries, the, the, the prime minister, the office of the prime minister or the equivalent, the president champions these sorts of policies. So the regulatory framework 
presented in this bill may at first sight appear that appears as it is following good practice, in some instances it is, where the risk of the special economic zone is borne by the private sector or those participants of the joint venture. But upon closer look, there are areas that I have identified that can make the, this SEZ framework vulnerable to not only knowledge problems, but conducive to rent-seeking behavior. And rent-seeking behavior is the economic term for corruption. So the first thing that, the, the second thing that I want to talk about is the role of the operator. So Mr. Vice President, when I read the legislation, it appeared to me that the developer and the operator's role are lumped into one role under the role of the operator. So the operator is both the operator and the developer. According to best practice, that is okay, that is allowed. It, doesn't create any avenues or any gaps for knowledge, knowledge gaps and uh, rent-seeking behavior. But Clause 34 makes a provision that the operator's license can be granted to a public body, a private body, or a PPP. Clause 40 goes on to detail what the operator is responsible for. But in the interpretation section, a public body can mean a body cooperate amongst other things. The Special Economic Zone Authority is a body cooperate. Does this mean that the authority can get involved in the operation of a zone? Further, in the, further investigation under Clause 21 1D confirms that the authority need indeed can participate in the operation of a special economic zone. The clause says, and I quote, the funds of the authority shall comprise monies earned by or arising from investment by the authority in connection with the operation of zones. This, Mr. Vice President, is a conflict of interest in my view. The authority should not have any role in the development and operations of special economic zones. Because then you're placed in a situation where the authority is the one granting a license, but also operating that special, operating that special economic zone, when they also have an uh, avenue to report to the minister on policy, uh, report to the minister on, de on, on selected designated sites, it, it becomes too suspicious. In my opinion, no public body should engage in operation of a, a, of a special economic zone unless it is intervening to correct some significant market failure. This should strictly be, to me, this whole operation of the special economic zone should be done via private investment or also through the joint ventures or public pri private partnership arrangement. Any bias towards public SEZs can erode their competitiveness and dissuade investments from private sector developers. And it is something that has been prominent in um, many countries. I think it was Bangladesh, for example, had severe challenges with that. So, and the thing is, what could potentially happen here as well is that you may end up in a situation where countries like China comes in and capitalize on all the designated special economic zones, which has, which has served to be detrimental in, like, in, in many countries. For example, CPEC Pakistan. It is presented and advertised and portrayed as this very successful initiative. But when you, deep, when you look deep into the detail, you see how much significant negative econ economic and social consequences it has resulted to the domestic economy of Pakistan. Now, I'm not saying that publicly owned SEZs cannot also achieve su successful results. For example, the vast majority of SEZs in Singapore, China, and Korea 
are publicly owned and have been consistently effective. However, Mr. Vice President, these countries have sufficient financial resources, are less impacted by bureaucracy, uh, and possess strong trade and logistical links. And more so, countries like China have reached to such a position after years of trial and error, years of experimentation. They have, they have reached the point of efficiency and effectiveness in special economic zones via a gradual process taking a very pragmatic approach. So it's not as simple as, you know, China successful, South Korea successful, and we just copy it and paste it here, and then automatically overnight, or within one year or two years, we have special economic zones being so successful in Trinidad and Tobago. No, this is a gradual process that has significant knowledge gaps and also have potential for a lot of rent-seeking behavior. So, for this reason, most countries in emerging economies, emerging economies um, tend to struggle to replicate the conditions that China has has created for their success. So I want to stick a pin here to comment on the granting of the license with a predefined eligibility criteria. Now I have some comments on the eligibility criteria. I would not go into detail uh, on it here right now. But what I want to question is why not allow entities applying for licenses, any one of the three licenses, why not allow for them to compete for these licenses by a fair and equitable procurement process? Now, I know there may be some industries that may, may not have more than one applicant or one interested party, but what happens when there are more than one interested party? And you have one designated area that only one that could would facilitate only one company. Mr. Vice President, I believe that once there is sufficient room for competition, we should let we should create room in the legislation to allow for that competition to take place. We have all these fancy procurement laws that we passed just recently. Why not put them to use to encourage fair and equitable opportunity to compete for any of these licenses? Mr. Vice President, I, I want to move on to the alignment of this SEZ strategy to the national development strategy and also on our local comparative advantages. The bill under clause 33, subsection C, does indicate that, and I quote, any geographical area designated as a special economic zone shall be taken into account whether the area is one that is identified as having growth potential in the government's development plan. Now, I looked at the Vision 2020 policy document. Uh, I believe this is the national development plan that the law is referring to, but it has no evidence of areas identified as having growth potential. Other than mention made in this document on the opportunities in the northeastern part of Trinidad, that is Toko, it focuses on discussing the connectivity between Trinidad and Tobago via building the Toko port, etc. That is the only area that is identified in um, the Vision 2030 document. So I think the minister needs to provide some clarification on this. Which national development plan of the country are we working with here when we speak about having that alignment to the growth potential? And, 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 and I ask as well, what exactly characterizes this growth potential? Further, Mr. Vice President, I also believe the bill should capture the instances when feasibility assessments must be done to designate a special economic zone, a development zone, a free port, a free zone, and an industrial park. Because 
I, I'm trying to figure out what is the criteria that you're using to determine the growth potential, especially when, especially since I was not able to find it in the Vision 20, 2030 National Development Plan. So I would appreciate some clarification from the minister on this. This, the other thing on the, in terms of the alignment with national um, strategies and plans, I, I also want to speak a little bit about the alignment with comparative, the alignment of the SEZ policy with, with the comparative advantage of the country. Now, I looked at the trade policy that was published in 2019, and while the trade policy uses comparative advantage and trade complementarity analysis in its methodology to identify the various sectors for which we are going to allow these SEDs to operate, it is detailed in Schedule 3. This is all good. But you know what, Mr. Vice President? I would advise against identifying any sectors at all in this piece of law. And hear me out. I say this because... The big problem with the methodology used to identify these sectors is that it is backward looking and doesn't consider future trends and changes in demand, which could be important given the rapid and dynamic environment we currently live in, live in that is brought, or brought on by the pandemic. And this is not even taken into consideration the severe distortions of HS level data that is used to categorize um, different sectors and trade in different goods and services in different goods. So, Mr. Vice President, what I'm saying is that more work needs to be done to identify local strengths, which this, which this SSE model should be based on. And it is important to conduct an in-depth analysis that include a rigorous assessment of the local market conditions, our connectivity our industrial base, supply chain, business environment, international environment, land, labor supply, and skills, skills matches. So now, and I am sure across all ministries in Trinidad and Tobago, documents containing these analysis already do exist. It's just a matter of bringing all the line ministries together and collating that information together. Because, Mr. Vice President, I honestly think that the authority needs, the authority would need to have something like a strategic plan. And this strategic plan is what, this strategic plan is, would contain the long-term goals of the special economic zone, which would guide the, which would guide the, the special economic zone policy. Now, the legislation outlines that um, an operate, operating plan should be submitted by the authority, but that is not enough. I think we should also put in there that we, we have a, a, a strategic plan because what an operating plan does is that it focuses on how you're going to make your long-term plans or long-term goals happen. Where are the long-term goals, goals coming from? So, clear policy direction, clear strategic planning, and clear operational planning. I move now, Mr. Vice President, to the authority. The best practice on su successful special economic zones, the authority is usually, the authority is the regulator and the most critical pillar of the country's special economic zones policy and it should be sufficiently empowered. Ideally, it should have minimum interference from the government. And note, I'm not saying no interference from the government because the Ministry of Trade is the one that guides trade policy in the country. It must be separated from ownership, development, and the operation of the zones, which I already covered. It must have access to private sector representatives and experts. It must have strong relationships with line ministries and central government authorities relevant to special economic zones. 
But let us look at the functions of the authority before I delve into that. Let us look at the functions of the authority under Clause 5. It is evident that when I read the functions, it is evident in my mind, that we are still at the early stages of the thought process on what the role of the regulatory body, the authority, is going to be. When I look at the functions, I'm immediately having problems with clauses 5G to G as the functions of the authority. And let me refer to them. These are facilitating and, en and en enabling environment developing modern, modern in infrastructure required to attract FDI and stimulate domestic investment, promote economic development in local communities, advance further diversification of the economy. Now, I understand where, I understand where the um, drafters of the bill and the policymakers are going with this, but to me, these appear to be outcomes of your broad economic and trade policy and should not be a function of the authority. It is really the outcomes of successful implement implementation of the, special, of the special economic zone. And it is contingent upon successful coordination among all ministries, institutions, and policies, which is a main deficiency in the country for years. When I say a, ma a major deficiency, coordination across line ministries continue to be a challenge. I know that. With, so, which is why best practice suggests that special economic zone regulators should report to a central authority to minimize interference from ministries and ensure proper coordination to the highest possible level of government. In this case, the Minister of Trade is the one that is spearheading this. But this, is, this does not mean to undermine the capability and the capacity of the Minister of Trade, but I, having experience with implementing um, projects with multilateral lending agencies in the past, especially with the Ministry of Trade, there has been several challenges that uh, we experience and continue to experience over the years that tends to drag deliverables for years and years just because you can't get one line ministry on board or to agree with one thing. And, and you see, Mr. Vice President, this special economic zone um, would require a lot of interoperability across line ministries. And I'm not sure whether the Minister of Trade is the one that has equal access and bargaining power with all the line ministries. Mr. Vice President. Senator, you have five more minutes. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, my point is that reporting to high-level central body would allow the authority to coordinate policies across different ministries more effectively since an office such as the Prime Minister's office would have equal access to all ministries, which might not be the case for line ministries. So, Mr. Vice President, with that being said, having a special, a special economic zone regulatory body who may not have equal access to all ministries mean that they would not be able to fulfill those functions that I identified earlier. facilitating an enabling environment, developing modern infrastructure, promoting economic development in local communities, advance further diversification of the economy. And what this means is that, in a way, we kind of automatically setting up the authority to be in a position where they are unable to have control over fulfilling its role and function. Mr. Vice President, I have some proposed amendments uh, in terms of cleaning up the functions of the authority. Uh, I would circulate them. I wouldn't delve into them right now because time is against me. I would move on to making a comment on the board of the authority. Many have already, many 
previous senators have already spoken on the composition of the board. And I am in agreement with some of the suggestions raised by previous independent senators on the membership of the board. I know the minister did tell me that she have some amendments that would be circulated, so I'm not too sure if it would be captured there. But I, I would also like that there is private sector representation on the board. Um, at least three members of the three of the eleven members of the board should come from the private sector, appointed by the minister, but subjected to but subjected to being nominated from a group of bodies representing private sector interests. I would go further to add that the expertise in dealing with structuring public-private partnership should be represented on the board. And that, that is critical. All of this is important, Mr. Vice President, to ensure that there is proper private sector participation and private sector knowledge, and to avoid coordination failures among different stakeholders to avoid any sort of governance problems. This would allow for the decentralization of decision making at the regulatory level. I will go further to recommend that at least one representative um, on the board come from the investment promotion companies, um, one from Invest TT and one from Export TT. I know that probably is already in the mind of the um, minister, but I think we should state it in the law because it is really critical to have that uh, uh, those two agencies that is responsible for promoting marketing, um, export diversification, and attraction of foreign direct investment uh, are represented on the board. And also, uh, the investor may be playing a very critical role in the promotion and marketing of these special economic zones. So, in Ghana, for example, uh, the, the CEO of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center and the CEO of the Export Promotion Council are both members of the, um, of the authority, but they are there as non-voting members. Uh, a critical part that I think is missing in this bill, and uh, during my research, I, I discovered that a lot of special economic zones tend to uh, establish or implement something called a one-stop shop. And what this essentially does is that they provide in the law to have the authority oversee an entity, a sub-entity of the authority, which, which um, is one area where all investors can go and get all their regulatory, but all their regulatory requirements um, submitted. Mr. Vice President, I know time is up. Um, I've submit, I will submit this in an amendment and look forward to committee stage. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Honorable Senators, before we move to the next speaker, I think now is a good time to take a break. This Senate shall now stand suspended until 1 p.m. <laughs>